One Piece live action over at Netflix season one. This is going to be my spoiler filled thoughts on episodes one through eight, though I've already given a deep dive on episodes one and two, so I'll be lighter there. Bang, check that out if you'd like to. And I'm excited to say at the end of this video, I will be sitting down to have a conversation with Kayla, who has never consumed any One Piece before watching season one. So if you'd like to stick around at the end to kind of see those virgin eye I regret phrasing it that way. Thoughts on live action One Piece versus me, who's read up into and a little bit after Wano? Stick around for that. If you don't know what Wano is, don't worry about it. If you don't wanna watch that full deep dive though, I'm gonna quickly say, I think episodes one and two, especially with hindsights, were a massive accomplishment in not only adapting One Piece, but proving we are in a day and age of adaptation that can exceed if the right effort and consideration is put in most of our expectations. Even though I do certainly have criticisms of the season coming up, especially in the middle, this show as a whole is about a thousand times better than I expected it to be. I had this feeling in my gut up until I saw the last trailers that really made me feel like this could have some serious potential, that we were gonna see this adaptation just land flat on its face. And I'm thrilled to say that is not in the case. I don't think anyone could even argue in good faith that this adaptation is a complete failure, even if they have the most cynical view of it. And I think that was proven in episode one and two with the standout performances with Luffy, Nami, Buggy, and Zoro, in that order, fight me, just totally embodying the characters. And now that I've watched all eight, it's incredible how the character of Luffy has been brought to screen. It doesn't always work. There are some moments that cause me to groan in terms of just the cornball being a bit too much, but it's kind of the character of Luffy for those to be there. So I'm able to excuse the ones that don't land and the ones that do were just shockingly poignant. I maintain my favorite moment from episode one is when Luffy finds Zoro tied up and essentially is like, yeah, I'll let you go and please close this after me. I think we're gonna end up being friends. It just felt tonally exactly right for the formation, not only of these two characters, but the nuances of their relationship and how Luffy, like a wave eroding away at a rock, wins Zoro over to the point where he is fiercely loyal. And Nami here, I really liked, especially having gone back to the episode, how lethal she feels, not like in the literal sense, but in everything she does. I feel like Emily Rudd and her performance of Nami is adding this energy of just movement where she's kind of just going from one thing to the next and it fits in and builds this urgency to the character that as you learn more about what's truly motivating them really fits. And that energy in later episodes, once a twist happens, is really dampered down. And I can't help but think that was an intelligent performance and choice from the actress. Again, wider thoughts in episode one there, but let's go ahead and get into episode two a little bit, which yes, hindsight, just totally gonna reiterate here. Buggy's performance is so fantastic. The charisma in every line, even when it feels just too much, feels too much in a right way, which I kind of that over the topness is a continued through line for live action One Piece working. Hey, if you gotta do absurd, lean into the absurdity, don't half ass it. And I take back what I said in that video about almost wishing we had gotten less buggy because we do get more buggy as the season goes on. And this actor, man, <laughs> <laughs> He's so buggy. I know it's too soon to make declarations like this without eventually possibly coming to regret it, but Jeff Ward's buggy has certainly made a bigger impact on me as a character than Buggy did in the manga or anime. I'm not saying it's better overall or anything crazy like that, but this one specific character did resonate with me in terms of first impressions stronger here. Like, no question. And throughout all of the episodes, this setting of the Twisted Circus is my favorite set design, vibe, uh, just environment the actors have to work with throughout the entire season. And we even get that end stinger, which of course, is leading toward Arlong. Arlong's build throughout this whole season was handled about as well as I feel like it possibly could have been for such a condensed version of this story. Arlong was somehow one of the big standouts for the season overall, but we'll get there, we'll get there, slow it down. Because unfortunately we have to now transition into my two least favorite episodes of this whole season. That'd be three and four. Tell no tales and the pirates are coming. But quickly a word from today's sponsor. Hey, yeah you, I know you've been chipping away at that big project of yours. Is it acing a big test? Creating your dream design? 
Maybe writing a book? A book? Wow, that's amazing! But I've noticed that every time you sit down to get started, well, uh, this seems to happen. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it seems like you're in need of a little focus. Well, the great news is, Endel has you covered. Whether it's struggling to concentrate, suffering from stress or anxiety, or simply having difficulty falling asleep, Endel is here to help. Did you know that sound has a direct effect on your physical and mental well-being? Really? Let me give you an example. When you hear this, <laughs> God. Are you feeling ready to write that emotionally stirring scene in your novel? Probably not. Endel creates personalized soundscapes that are based on neuroscientific and psychoacoustic principles. This app uses real-time inputs like your heart rate and circadian rhythm for the best maximum effect. And guess what? Type, we've gotta do this! Endel is offering a great deal! The first 100 people to download Endel by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code will get a free week of audio experiences. So if you're looking to create the best environment for your success, check out Endel by clicking the link below. Now, I will say, fitting in with exactly how I felt toward Usopp when he was first introduced in the manga, I don't love this interpretation of Usopp that much, but you could argue that's just very Usopp and maybe I'll come to love him one day. The chemistry between him and Kaio was probably my favorite part of the entire buildup and dynamic for Usopp here, but when he's running through Surab Village and acting so childish, maybe including the Usopp pirates would have made this land a little better, but I, I don't see how you could have made this be as strong as it needed to overall. It's a really hard ask for a performer to present this character so overtly and in such a for me personally, unlikable way. And then combine that with Syrup Village kind of feeling like the least committed to set for any larger environment. To me, it just kind of felt like three or four sets that did not have as much polish as many of the other, though plenty of fun little Easter eggs for fans in the background. It just almost felt like in terms of set design, the Easter eggs were the focus rather than really realizing Syrup Village. And then once we kind of move in toward the mansion, it started feeling a bit like a Scooby-Doo mystery to me rather than the underdog straw hat crew versus a larger threat. And for some reason, even though the threat of the main bad played by <laughs> even though the threat played by Alexander Mentaeus, Mentaeus? Menatus, Menatus was acted well, the cat pirates moved into the territory of just so absurd, it didn't quite work for me. And it felt like the shooting for these sequences, aside from the action ones, uh, wasn't sure how exactly to present the tone these episodes were going for. We had these like exuberant over the top exclamations for Luffy undercut by attempts at tension that I feel were more successful than like the over the top loofers moments here. But something about this whole mixture didn't pan out. And the Marines, when I first watched the episodes were maybe my least favorite plot line going through this with Colby uh, being in charge of this investigation. But in hindsight, especially with the first two episodes, I appreciate how much the Marines were focused on in this first season. There's just, in terms of the overall meal presented, this is where we started hitting some bumps in the road. Shout out though to the action sequences with Zoro, which were delicious. In fact, I don't think there is a weak action sequence in season one as a whole, even against these kitty pirates. But that leads itself nicely into the background. The information we get on Zoro here, I quite enjoy. And I believe there's a small reference about him getting lost in the mansion. <laughs> that worked. But yes, the young Zoro actor really added uh, depth to the character we're seeing now, while certainly feeling like just a younger version of this man. The casting there, stellar. And I was really afraid what we were going to lose in terms of development of characters' pasts. And season one seems to have just staunchly refused to do that with Zoro and Nami. Episode five might be my favorite, second favorite of the whole season. My favorite's gonna be the last episode, but episode five, this is the introduction of Sanji. And Sanji is done so well. Taz Skyler just drips in Sanji. I don't know how else to put it. He plays him, I think, slightly cooler than Sanji does come across in the manga or the anime, but I can appreciate that. And it makes some of the more cringy edges to Sanji's character uh, come across in a much more digestible way, I feel, to a wider audience. So that was just like a decision that I, I can be like, yeah, to have him be that way. And his fighting style, the kicks, translated 
so much better to the screen than even my highest expectations. I can't wait to see these characters continue to escalate in power because the continued interpretations of what One Piece powers can be have been sensational, like with the cutaway to Mihawk we see. And so even if the visuals don't always look perfect, they're so committed to just flat out showing what the powers of One Piece are. And also just the environment of the restaurant was perfect and how the characters moved in and out around it, the contained uh, atmosphere of just having these ships in this floating restaurant, yet still feeling like our cast had so much space to move around in and sets to play with, uh, just shows how much Netflix has invested in terms of practical elements as well to bringing the world of One Piece to life. This really felt through and through, like a living, breathing version of one of the iconic locations of the blue. Another standout from this episode would be the bonding that happens between Zoro and Nami. In terms of pacing, the writers, in my opinion, are doing a really good job of knowing exactly when to sprinkle these crew bonding, getting to know each other scenes in. And Luffy in this episode, the way he bounced around from character to character and was able to just charismatically feel like he was in some way, shape or form, making a tremendous impact on everyone he encountered, felt so Luffy. Luffy is one of these people who's just so powerful as a presence in an alternative way that nearly everyone who comes across his past throughout the entire history of One Piece is immensely impacted by meeting him. And that is being realized, especially in this episode, to its fullest extent. It's like his presence makes other people want to do better. At least I've often felt that in the manga. And seeing that here kind of provided this homey feel to the story that continually reminded me, yeah, we're in one piece for sure. And for in hindsight, how not too, too much time on the screen together they had, the relationship between Chef Sanji and the chef provided so much heart and emotion. And the way it leads into the next episode was the moment I believe that completely sold Kayla emotionally in watching the show with me. Cause it's where she started being like, next episode, next episode. Speaking of next episode, the chef and the chore boy. Something that I can imagine being a source of conflict in the writer's room of like, do we want to spend this much time on this build up for a character? And they absolutely made the right call. Definitely, yes. The whole stranded sequence was like, perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. And the reveal of him eating his own leg for Sanji makes you go from like having some hesitations around this possible pirate guy who you can call is of course going to be like a supportive father figure to Sanji, but like how good of one, especially with how cleverly they've kind of presented him gruffly up in this point. But seeing the reveal of him eating his own leg is just like, oh, you might be even a better person than I am. Holy crap. <laughs> and the utilization of the conflict between Chef and Sanji growing to him eventually being motivated to go off and join the Straw Hats creates this depth of emotion where it's like a mother bird removing their young from the nest and the potential of Sanji possibly being reached. And with just an open invitation from Luffy that is so on brand, it all fell into place. There's a little bit of like, oh, well, how committed is Sanji to this crew if this is what, but it's undercut by the chemistry that kind of is immediately there. And and once Zoro and Sanji start giving each other crap, I was like, oh yay, yet another dynamic within the Straw Hat crew just checked off being realized we here. But this episode also includes our first real encounter with Arlong's crew, and it is just fun. Like this whole action sequence is so enjoyable in terms of not only the initial conflicts and threats as these fish people come into play, uh, but the escalation once again of power. It feels like we're having that slow crawl up the ladder in terms of the potential for villains within One Piece, which in hindsight does make the cat pirates to me feel like a, a weaker rung <laughs> just overall, but it's made up for here so strongly. And we've sat in the environment of this restaurant long enough that when the violence occurs, you have that familiarity to kind of see where people are going as a result of like, you know, the big bombastic hits uh, before they even happen. I was a little afraid that the whole conflict of the fish people would be mishandled, but as far as I can recall from first reading it, ages ago. This is a as true as you could be in this condensing of the story for Arlong and the motivations. And there is a presentation of these people and their conflict literally transcends into the music and everything that's presented here that feels ham-fisted. It feels blunt, but Luffy's conflict, but Luffy conflict. 
but Luffy's conflict with all of these people, you can tell, is completely unrelated to their main motivating force, and instead, it does come down to a very personal Luffy's issue with Arlong, obviously stemming from Nami betraying the crew and going off, just like she did before, uh, with Arlong. And Luffy's fight with Arlong felt roughly how it should to me. I will say the realization of Luffy in fight scenes is obviously the biggest ask for anyone in terms of performances. It's not easy as an actor to be like, okay, I need to present this over the top positive force of nature who is going to be stretching in a way I have to just imagine and then maintain like momentum and force for it. It's difficult. And as Luffy's powers continue to expand and his personality gets even stronger, it's just gonna get harder. But fortunately, everything around that kind of clumsy at this point angle sold me on it. And the fight on the docks with Luffy's weakness was all presented well enough. Oh my God, I forgot to get into Mihawk and Zoro. I thought that was this episode, but it's the last. Rewinding, Mihawk shows up. And Zoro's fight with Mihawk, I enjoyed and certainly think the strongest part of it was the emotion uh, from Zoro. The buildup in the episode before really added weight to his wanting to be the greatest swordsman and the showcasing of the threats that exist in the world through Zoro's easy, decisive feat, despite Zoro being one of the strongest people we've encountered in the whole story, really added the feeling that Luffy might not fully understand what he's getting this crew involved in. And this could just be a, I can't say that word on YouTube mission. And I think that's even emphasized more with the next episode showcasing us that island stranding that highlights not just the enemies that are present, but also how the environmental dangers of being a pirate. All of which does Nami's character justice because she is witnessing not only Zoro defeat, but Luffy, in her opinion, making an incorrect decision as a captain to even let this fight happen in the first place. So this storyline complements Nami's where no, she's not ready to ask Luffy and his crew for help. And why would she? This seems like a childish man, an overconfident fighter, and Usopp trying to take on the world when she has something so personal to her that is acting as her main motivating conflict. It just actually feels like intelligent writing and makes it so you can't question why Nami isn't just asking for help, opening up about everything because while well, these people might be her friends, they are not connected to what she is actually engaging with and not proving themselves yet to be competent enough to actually be there for her. So I feel like the writers did a really good job kind of tying all these narrative beats into a moment that absolutely justifies a character decision that if handled differently, uh, could have fallen apart under scrutiny. And I just feel like One Piece fans were done justice. But once Zoro does lose, the whole Mihawk being like, find me once you've trained and Zoro's declaration of I will never fail you again, Luffy. Mwah. Little, little exploding kiss. Mwah. And they actually are putting the sword in the mouth, which is, it's there and I love it, but it also raises just all the questions. <laughs> but getting back to where we were in episode six, Nami's betrayal uh, after Luffy is clearly about to be killed by Arlong. There is that corny moment where Arlong's just about to kill Luffy and Nami's like, don't even waste your time. And we all know she's saving Luffy's life. And that, from a writing standpoint, I was like, is Arlong that stupid? It feels like he's that stupid. But that's completely saved, in my opinion, by the whole crew deciding to unite and go off and save Nami from what appears to be her willing servitude of Arlong to them. But of course we know it is not the case. In episodes seven and eight, you basically have to watch back to back. Like they're begging for it the way episode seven ends, all of it. This is just the big final climactic showcasing of the potential of One Piece. And I'm happy to say it is one of the strongest episodes followed up by the strongest episode, especially with how they took the care to recreate certain shots from the manga that are just so iconic here. Uh, this, this is what made me realize I'm gonna be excited for every single season of One Piece until I am proven that I shouldn't be from here on out. Part of the reason all of this works though is the lack of hesitation in terms of just brutality from Arlong. We see Nami's backstory in these episodes as she is a little girl who's living in a village that is invaded by these pirates and they are essentially forced to just pay incredible amounts of money to keep this pirate crew going and prevent them from just being massacred. And Nami's mother is raising her and her sister and then is killed by the pirate crew in front of Nami and her sister. And it's, it was, I knew it was gonna happen, but it, it, it's, it will, 
It happened in a way that didn't pull punches. I'm surprised to say, usually I feel like ratings for shows are a bit too harsh. Uh, these last two episodes, I was like, yeah, I can see why this was rated TV 14. We just had a parent executed in front of their children. Whoa. But from here until the end, Emily Rudd just gets all of the berries from me for how much emotion, depth, weight she is able to provide Nami. Because of course we learned the reason Nami uh, decided to go and try and work for these pirates who killed her adoptive mother was because uh, it's the only way she could free her village and she was trying to get together a hundred million berries. She has successfully done this through her various adventures and goes to dig it up. But Marines that have been being paid off by Arlong are tipped off that Nami has this money, so they go to confiscate it, right as Nami is able to explain to her sister uh, just how much has gone wrong, why she's doing what she's doing, etc., etc. I would regret it if I didn't risk being a little redundant here and once again praising sound design and especially set design here, the Tangerine Grove to Arlong's hideout, and finally the map rude Nami was forced to work in for so many years. Seeing them realized in a way that didn't feel plastic or cheap and instead lived in and a part of the One Piece world. I'm just impressed, like, Practical sets are the way to go, and I know there are digital touch-ups here, but things are built and present and worn and given that extra little effort to have details for fans. And I don't know, this is just gonna become my go-to example to point at that there are absolutely ways that like full CGA environments can hit, but I've yet to see one hit as well as the practical built sets of One Piece, which if you look more and more into the behind the scenes, were really created environments. But while all this is happening, we also see Luffy and the Straw Hat crew arrive to the village that has been so destroyed over the years by Arlong's pirates. And this is the closest thing we've seen in terms of hatred from Luffy. He really comes to hate Arlong and everything he's done. And so it, again, doesn't feel like it's about Arlong's cause, but more of a personal issue between Luffy Luffy, Arlong, and Nami, which is the correct way to handle this. I also really love mentions of Jimbei and things like that. I can't spoil things, but it makes me really happy. At the end of the episode though, our Straw Hats and Nami are reunited. As Nami's money is taken from her and we see her crying on the ground, Luffy comes and the moment, the fucking moment, you know what I'm talking about with the hat. Ha! And then there's that one specific shot from the panel that's recreated. And that's why I was like, Episode eight, motherfucker, let's go. Like when she's stabbing her tattoo, all of it, it it's genuinely like almost tear inducing. Like I, I thought this show was so over the top and zany at times that maybe in these more crucial, not dark, but traumatizing moments that exist within One Piece throughout the whole series came about, it could struggle to actually provide them the necessary heartstring tugs for them to feel true to the source material. But if they are consistently as strong as this one, I don't have any, I'm, I'm so, yep, okay, I'll be watching One Piece till the end. And while I think the only kind of weaker points of structure for this whole season were in episodes three and four, I wanna heap additional praise on just how they did set up episodes seven and eight. As I mentioned, it feels like episode eight begs to be watched right after episode seven. The momentum that's happening within the narrative is crashing like a wave, but with a full episode ahead after this time, me as a viewer was comforted that this conflict isn't gonna feel rushed. It's it's gonna get the time it deserves. And boy, oh boy, did it. Now I've largely neglected talking about Garp throughout this review, but let's go ahead and get into uh, what is happening with him arriving this island as well. And that's because the Garp stuff really comes to a head here. And the buildup with Colby and the guy whose name I can never say right, actually started working with me, though I'd be lying if I didn't say it was kind of bugging me and hitting and missing throughout the season up until this point. But knowing they're coming to the island, that this person who seems so far above and beyond and has contacts with people like Mihawk, um, just oof. Like I love the ability of a show to have the main conflict, but introduce an effective, well-earned secondary conflict that almost adds like a ticking clock element, even in victory over in the original conflict. Like, ooh, that well structured. But the main focus of this episode, of course, is the assault on Arlong's base, where we see our straw hats fully functioning, united for the first time against a threat uh, that feels 
bigger than anything they've come across uh, before. Zoro and Sanji just having this competition, making their way through the camp was somehow my third favorite fight happening here. My first being, of course, Luffy and Arlong, which yeah, absolutely felt like an anime fight, which traditionally adapts terribly to live action, but because of the characterization of this political extremist and a personality extremist, it's believable that they're stopping talking and yelling out moves and everything. Like, holy crap, I just saw an anime fight still feel like an anime fight brought to live action and work. What magical spell was required to make that happen? And when Luffy went gum gum gatling, oh god damn it, it worked! And there's a moment where Luffy seems like, okay, I know I'm not gonna beat you, so I'm just gonna destroy the environment. And he starts having the environment destroyed around him. But then he still just beats the shit out of Arlong, so he gets victory both ways. My second favorite fight, though, is Usopp running <laughs> and <laughs> creating a firebomb to take out a guy, uh, which I, I don't remember what exactly happened in the manga that's equivalent to that, but damn it, Usopp keeping in tradition of Usopp, he's starting to win me over. And even when he runs back and is like, yeah, we did it with everyone else, I was, I was laughing. Nami runs out of the palace though, they watch it collapse, but from the rubble comes Luffy, victorious, just screaming out his adoration and love, and it's, it, Good God! I'm just as emotionally invested in this show as I was the first time I consumed the story. How? And each member of the crew either felt right to unbelievably good in terms of interpretations with their character, and every single dynamic between the crew they've taken the time to flesh out also feels good to unbelievably good in terms of how it's being realized on screen. I'm so excited. I'm genuinely excited. Garp then shows up and has a confrontation with Luffy while they are celebrating in the village. And this is one beat of the end I am not as sure how I feel about. I like Colby, I like Luffy in these moments, I even like Garp. There's just something strange here where it's still up in the air how it's going to settle on my shoulders in terms of an interpretation of One Piece. Though I found myself smiling as Garp leaves, kind of giving his blessing, and Luffy is now going to go freely off to be a pirate. Yeah, at the end though, I, I was, nah, but yeah, okay. We cut from there though to an emotional goodbye with Nami and her sister, and maybe my favorite non-major narrative thrust moment from this whole show then happens, where Luffy gets to see his first wanted poster, and, is perfect. I, I would not, the fact that Colby delivered, it's all, spot on. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then the wanted poster that of course, super awesomely, everyone's been interacting with their wanted posters throughout the season. I love that choice. It is so deliciously absurd. But we see Shanks gets to see Luffy's wanted poster and the pride and joy in this Markiplier looking mother -er. Oh, and seeing the tangerine trees and the going merry, like this whole final 20 minutes of live action One Piece was just me smiling at the screen going, God damn, they did it. And that's kind of my review of One Piece out of 10. A they did it. There's some stumbles, but God damn, it's way better than anyone had any right to expect. And I'm gonna be giving season one of Netflix as a whole, a solid eight out of 10. I can't imagine Netflix bringing a better One Piece to us, and it really does feel like something that Netflix poured a ton of resources in to try and make another flagship, and with One Piece rising to all-time high popularity, I can't imagine this isn't gonna pay off, and yes, we've also had it confirmed that as soon as strikes and things are done, season two of One Piece will begin production. So, we're in for another round, and I cannot wait to see the most Adaptable character ever. You can't, no, this is the one I'm looking forward to more than anything else. Okay, actually I'm looking forward to Water 7 the most because Nico Robin is the best member of the Straw Hat crew, fight me, and that entire sequence has so much potential. But let me know your thoughts of One Piece live action in the comments down below, and I'm going to quickly transition to Kayla and I talking about One Piece spoiler filled. A three, a two, a three, five, We're sorry if the audio is a little bit echoey. I've had to pack up all of my sound padding because mm -hmm. moving and my spare mic, so we're gonna be sharing one. Yay. Hi, um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to start this. I'm just really excited. Wait, you wanna do a cool intro start thing? Sure. Just high five together. Wah! That, that didn't was, work. Okay, one Hold more. Down. 
There we go. I'm a huge manga gal. I've- Yeah, you've never read One Piece. Yes, I've never read One Piece. That was one of those mountains that I looked at in the distance and I'm like, ooh, that's a big hill to climb. I don't know if I can commit to that. You pretended in Korea once to have read it for a job. Yes, oh my gosh. I had to go <laughs> to the One Piece cafe and I had to talk about One Piece like I knew what I was doing and I had to eat drag, was it the devil fruit thing? You called it dragon fruit? I don't know. It's the purpley <laughs> swirly thing. So I had to eat one of the devil fruits and there were all these characters and I was supposed to talk about which one I liked the most and I just had no idea who anyone was. So I was like, dude with the speedo is rocking it. Man with the flamingo feathers killing it. And I love the girl with the red hair. She seems badass. And that was all I could really say. So I think for me, going into this, I was really excited, but also nervous because as someone who loved uh, Attack on Titan and then saw the Attack on Titan live action. They ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. Uh, I was like, this can go a variety of directions here. It's funny, the ironic thing is I think it'd be way easier to adapt Attack on Titan to live action than One Piece. So this is just showcasing how much more of a success this was. I remember watching the first episode because you, someone who has known this world and the characters and what the tone is like for it as well, obviously was able to look at it through a lens where you're like, did they capture the essence of the world from the beginning? For me, you I took it fresh. I took it fresh, which was great because upon the opening credits, I immediately went, oh, okay, this is not going to be like Game of Thrones adaption. Like we're taking this serious, like this is gonna be dark and gritty. Oh God, that'd be the worst creative decision possible. No one would try to do that. If oh someone in the writer's room was like, we're gonna do serious One Piece, they'd get laughed out. Immediately as the credits were rolling and that map was unfurling into like the actual live set piece, I just thought to myself, this is going to be a whimsical, fun ride. And that's exactly what happened. Like yeah. I, I loved it. And actually, I didn't mention this in my main review. I was expecting more food porn, not, not people f***ing food. I was expecting more like just shots of Sanji making dishes. We got a couple things about that. We didn't get too much more. There's a lot of like, ooh, look Ghibli -esque. at this clays. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was expecting the Ghibli shots. Yeah, I could feel moments where there was clearly a dialogue that was presented like it was a very important manga panel. And I don't mean like Luffy's gum gum pistol or whatever, that clearly is just something that's part. I mean more of the dialogue interacted with certain antagonistic forces, I think, that I felt oh, this is clearly set up to give us a lot of information in a very short, condensed amount of time. And it did it well because I could follow the story. I did not see that um, head Marine being Luffy's grandpa at all. I remember- Really? You made a comment early on that I thought you predicted it. Cause it was like episode three. I even like made a mental note of this. You said something like, oh, this seems like really- per I think- I did. Was, you said the word familial or something yeah, along those lines. I did. <laughs> but was I like, oh. But I didn't actually think, it was one of those things where I'm like, gosh, there seems like personal here all of a sudden, he's really going after, but I didn't think they'd actually go, grandpa? And I remember when he said that, I let out the loudest, what? And I completely understand why people love One Piece the way they do, because I'm certain that the manga goes into so much more detail. That's one of my biggest compliments in this adaptation. They didn't drop too much of the important detail. There's lots of stuff lost. Never gonna claim not, but a lot, most of what they decided to keep is very intentional. I mean, God, I can imagine how much of a debate it was in the writer's room to keep the whole Shanzi chef island stranded thing. Cause it's a huge bulk of runtime for this, I'd say like 20 minutes. Yeah. Which when you're trying to condense one piece, that 20 minutes, valuable but it did so much emotionally for the send-off of Sanji I mean he's leaving the nest and him and the chef don't have a sit down where they're all okay but the goodbye is kind of like a oh yeah and I think this comes down to my favorite thing about One Piece versus other shows that we were watching at the same time they did a great job of setting up internal conflict for the characters so that way people like myself who don't know anything about this world the the magic you know all the different 
conflicts going on in terms of geographical and economical and all that, we still immediately latched onto each character because they set up internal conflict so well so, so early on. And they had such great pinch points throughout different episodes where you could see that's gonna come back and when it did come back, they built each thing up so when each impact hit, you felt that emotional draw to the characters. And that's why I think they chose wisely to keep the rock at sea with Sanji and the head chef there. Because that there, for someone who was introduced kind of more in the later episodes of season one, I felt a connection to Sanji. I felt their bond between these two people who yeah. seemed like they didn't like each other. That's choosing wisely what scenes are important for your story versus just having big bombastic fun scenes that might look pretty, you well, know? Well, I mean, the big bombastic, I mean, that's where they, they, they got to have their field days with those, the action scenes. I mean, there was so much fun happening. And I, I commented on how well Sanji's kicking actually translated to the screen, which uh -huh. I was worried about because all kick fighting, and if you watch, remember watching Blade, <laughs> yeah. where they're spinning in circles <laughs> near each other. Blade has really good choreography, don't get me wrong. But uh, there's a few kicking heavy sequences where it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Sanji is a really solid fighter. He gets overshadowed a lot being next to Zoro and Luffy, but he's supposed to present as someone who also can kick some serious <laughs> um, The only one who uh, didn't kick as much but they grow to kick in the future is Nami uh, because, you know, she's not supposed to be someone who can go toe to toe with Arlong right now. Well, and that's the thing, because I love that Nami still had a lot of agency and skill. You could see with her little pull thing that like would... Okay. <laughs> Do we have to cut all of that for copyright? Yeah. I really love that Nami herself still is able to handle herself in a way. She's not just this character who's constantly needing to be saved. They showed that she is capable. She is talented. She is skilled. She is, in, you know, intelligent. But there are even limits for her, in which case she needs to ask for help. And I think that's what me as a person connects with most because I don't like when I see characters particularly female characters who are told to be this strong, you know, amazing character, but we never get to see it because the main protagonist always comes in to save. And they also didn't do with this, sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I was just gonna wrap up and say I really like that they made sure we knew throughout the early episodes that she is talented. So by the time that Arlong point hit, I was like, yeah, she did her best and she couldn't and she needed to ask for help. And asking for help is something that is difficult for a lot of people, yeah. you know, myself included. So it made it just so more emotionally attached to all those characters and what they were going through. Going off what you said, well, I think there's a service done to the character as well. Of It would be very easy to just not justify Nami's decision making where it's like, why didn't she just go to Luffy and be like, hey, you're powerful, help me out. Like, yeah. you could, but we have that directly addressed. Luffy fights Arlong and gets his ass handed to him and Nami has to save his life. Yeah. And, yeah, Zoro's incapacitated at the time to just fight with Mihawk, but there's no reason for her to believe these people would really be able to help her. She's yeah. watched them be goofballs. Yeah. And I really want to talk about this with you. The emotional crux of having Nami question uh, Zoro's uh, decision to be able to go do this duel and say, like, Luffy, you failed as a captain, that added a ton of weight to mm. her decision because it's unrelated, but it's also everything. Because Luffy's failure to not help Zoro, which the show, I'm not sure if it's really trying to say Luffy's failure there, but there's mm. questionable things happening. Yeah. Um, where he failed to protect his crew, let's put it that way. Um, especially from Nami's perspective, you're like, yeah, I totally get the decision making. No one feels stupid. Everyone feels justified. I actually don't think Luffy at the beginning of the season could have handled that one. He had to learn a bunch of lessons and it's from his crew. It, it really pulls together on the wider story level where I never feel like I'm having to dumb down these characters to understand the decision they're making. The only thing that was a little questionable for me is like, Nami, why didn't you tell your sister? <laughs> but you know, sometimes people like to shoulder the burden on their own. They don't want to have other people suffer. You yeah. know, they like to keep them as safe and protected as possible. Like I think about my little brother. Um, and I'm like, gosh, if I was having something going on and I told him about it and he would want to help me, I'd be like, no, I don't want you anywhere near this. I want you as far away from this as possible. So like- Especially when that person that just killed a member of your family. Yeah, so I mean, some people might say, I don't get it, why wouldn't you tell her? But I'm like, in that situation where your mother was just killed, a group of like pirate shark 
fishman people just invaded and you are trying to master manipulate at that small tiny age of what was she like nine or something at the time uh, she was a kid? You know, um, terrible ages. um i don't know for me i can logically see from most people's perspectives much less a kid being like i don't want anyone else i care about being near this at yeah. all i want them as far away something i also wanted to do about character development before i go into anything else was i really loved how they also told the stories of Shanks's crew mm -hmm. and his relationship with Luffy. It was so, they're just brief glimpses, but it makes me so curious about Shanks as a person. And so that ending point where he gets to see Luffy's wanted poster, it just felt like that it was very well written that all these little points throughout the beginning few episodes were then revisited at the end. Thank you for bringing that up because it also folds into this maybe one of the best sources of tension in One Piece, and that's that largely at this early point in, in the journey, it feels like Luffy's kind of getting away with a lot of what he's doing because mm -hmm. he's just not coming across the people who can really smack him down yet. Mm -hmm. And this show really played into that nicely, where you see the Mihawks and stuff start hearing the name and being like, okay. Oh boy. And then whenever they do kind of grazingly have these contacts, they pay the price. Oh yeah. Because they are... It, it, it's that balance of we're not in the grand line yet. Yeah. We're, we're here in like the shallow tide waters. Yeah, this is like the coastlines here and we yeah. still haven't moved. Also, Mihawk, I could not unsee. He looks so much like Lucifer. <laughs> I couldn't unsee it. That, one of the things I wanted to transition into though is talking about both the scenery, like the setting itself and the usage of like certain details and certain graphics. So for example, I really loved how we got to learn about different pirates through those wanted posters, which I know you mentioned is something that's in the manga a lot. They don't snatch them like they do in the show, which is such a fucking sick oh, cool. decision. I love that. Um, yeah, that was just stylistically brilliant. Still, I'm just like so impressed with how we get a grasp of these characters without even really needing a lot of build up to it. It's just like, here's a wanted poster, here's how much they're worth, and here's the first thing they say when we snatch it out of the air. And you're like, oh, I get who this person is. The other thing, like little details that I really loved, and I know I even commented on them, was when the title page would come in, each One Piece title would be different. And so you'd see like one that has the the fishman symbol on mm -hmm. it during that episode, or one of them had like Bugsy's crew on it. it buggy, buggy? Buggy. Buggy. You knew kind of the theme that was going forward, which was so much fun for me because I could pick out those little details without having it ham fisted down my throat. <laughs> One Piece to me is like Candyland, the yeah. game, where every location I'm going into is very, very clearly. Verily. Verily. <laughs> Forsooth and Lakate, Huck. It, it's very clearly depicted. Kaya's house, which I did feel was the weaker of episodes, I still loved the details around her house where I could see these things about someone who, yeah, it gives the impression to Nami that has a lot of things, but clearly is living in this kind of gilded cage sort of way. Yeah. And I really liked the effort that they put in to add those details. There's now like whole forum things where it's like people who only watch the live action are like, what's this supposed to mean? What's that? And it's just like little things in the background they're picking out. And most of the time the top response I'm seeing is we did. Oh, I know. And, <laughs> and I know that would probably be like the, the thing that most people would say is just like, go read it. This should get you excited. And I even said to you, this makes me want to read One Piece. It's just that it is a big TBR list that you're doing yeah. there. That's a commitment. That is going to be time that you're taking to focus on this story. And I'm sure it's fun the whole way through, but it is a time commitment. So I think for people like myself, where we already have a very long TBR list and yeah, we'd like to get to it. It's really great to interact with people who are familiar with the story and like take part in the conversation, even if it's just a condensed form. Sorry, I just forgot something that I wanted to even say in the main part of the early section of the video, but I, I want to say here, you just reminded me of it. Um, I got some pushback by saying the Colby actor left me wanting a little bit. And I, I agree with people who said I was wrong. By the end of the season, Colby totally sold. Is Love. it Colby or Colby? I always, I switch between the two. I say every, there's a meme where I, I call them loopers. I just, I just say them wrong. Yeah, I, I think that actor did a really good job and I liked his relationship not only with Garth, but with uh, terrible haircut. Yes, oh my gosh, coconut head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Normally side stories, not just side characters, but like 
a separate story that's running parallel, oftentimes you'll find that the author tends to prefer one over the other. So you as the reader oftentimes enjoy following one more than the other. That did not happen with this. I loved Kobe Colby. Um, I loved Grandpa Doodads. I loved being able to be just as invested in that dynamic as I was in the Straw Hats. Obviously I love the Straw Hats more, but I was excited that these characters that we were introduced to in the first and second episode weren't just this one-off that was going to fade out and disappear eventually. Mm. It's just really great writing because you understand both sides chasing after their dreams. Yeah, which is like the theme of the first season that Luffy kind of yeah. establishes episode one. I like that they didn't say Nami was ever wrong for saying like, hey, you messed up with Zoro or that Luffy was right. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's not so straightforward, right? No, it's this not. Is, Zoro has the right to take that fight. Mm -hmm. And I think it could have argued be wrong also stepping in. It can argue be wrong not stepping in in some way because it's clear this is not a fight Zoro's gonna win. It's that delicate nuance of the theme of the dream versus the reality of a world that can be brutal. I mean, we see a man eat his own leg in this season. It, it can be dark. Yeah. Um, and that's that's where I think we're seeing wider audiences find that broader depth that a lot of people don't think One Piece has, that it absolutely does. And that's the thing, I, I really liked how, as you said, this was not a choice that has a right or wrong or a black and white answer yeah. and stuff. I really love gray writing where you as the audience are left being, I, I understand their perspective, but I also understand theirs. And if you look at the situation, but gosh, if, if I had this one dream and it presented itself in an option and somebody tried to talk me down to it, you know, I would be like, absolutely not. Mind your business. This is... This is my thing. You don't get to tell me what I get to do and what I don't get to do. Right, it continues that two lines of thought. Um, and I hope they continue to have that problem. Because yeah. Luffy's like, over... The, that never stops being an issue. Um, he, he has a... Not a one-dimensional view of the world. A one-track view of the world, is what I'll say. And that's what I thought was so interesting about his character. And also the dynamics in the show. Because one... I love platonic relationships being shown in fiction and to see that showcase throughout this and just the love and appreciation and protectiveness they have over each other and support, just incredible, but also the way they joke, it just makes it fun because that makes them people. They're not always getting along, they're not always seeing eye to eye, but they do have a deep affection and respect for each other, which I think is what builds a great friendship. You're not always going to get along with your friends. You're not always going to agree with them. But to be able to work through conflict and resolve, like that builds strong bonds. And they never make the conflict between them feel real enough to be like, oh, Zoro, when you have Sanji's back, we need it. Like, they, they, they're, they yeah. are a part of the crew. It's just that Sanji's the newest, and Zoro feels a little bit threatened. <laughs> and so it's like a, okay, we'll see how we're going to slot in together. We haven't figured out how we're going to fit together yet. Newest member holds the clown head. Which is, <laughs> which is a great, from a writing perspective, source of comedy for that fight scene. Mm -hmm. Like, to keep moving that through. It's a fairly obvious one, but oh, yeah. it's one that was utilized quite well. And I think the acting overall by the majority, like, the entire cast did really great, but I, I don't know the character's personality in the manga, so I can't say how well they represented each, but from my opinion, I felt Luffy does not think the way I think. I don't think he sees the world the way the rest of us do. No, it is... It's like, you know, they talk about boxers who are, like, obsessed with being the best off boxer and never losing, and, like, that's just become... He is an insanely positive version of that hyperfixation, yeah. which can be super toxic. And for times when Luffy converges into that. He's not an egomaniac. Like, he doesn't think he's the greatest thing ever. He just wants to be a pirate. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Um, and, and I think all of their, char their character traits and their personalities were well represented. So when I met each character, I immediately understood through the way they spoke, through some of the dialogue, what kind of personality they were. Sanji's character, I, I kind of was like, is this guy like a kind of pervert. I'm like, is he awkward with women? It feels like he's just one of those like, I'm not quite sure how to talk to people sort of thing. No, he's confidently flirting just in a Dude. way that makes everyone like, stop. Like each of their characters, I think Usopp was the only one that I kind of struggled with. I really liked how they incorporated him into the group mm -hmm. with the whole sharpshooting kind of aspect because I thought to myself, what is it that he's bringing? I hope they utilize his engineering angles later more because that's another thing. He's He's, he's the guy who knows the ship, right? Like, he, and they, that is important. I do wish 
Nami had had a smidge more to do when she's between leaving the temple and coming out and like meeting up with Zoro and Sanji. It's like this is her conflict, yeah. And she in that time is just kind of like leaving a collapsing <laughs> building, and I was yeah. like, oh. I mean, I get she's not the badass who can do the fighting yet. Yeah. Um, it's just like this was her conflict. And for a bulk of the fight, she's running with a map. I think Luffy at that point, he knows that one, Nami doesn't have the strength or ability to mm -hmm. take on Arlong. If she remains, yeah, she might be able to help in certain ways, but it's more likely that she will either be put in danger and Luffy will have to help her rather than focus on Arlong. Mm -hmm. And also that there's a higher percentage of her just getting hurt by yeah. the building in general. This, so. this is my fanfic. And I'm not saying this is a better choice, it's just where my mind wanders if they did it this way, if it could have come across a little more balanced. Luffy fighting Arlong, uh, and the, you know, Luffy's having trouble. And then instead of having Luffy realize like, oh, we can destroy this place by making Arlong hit it, instead you realize Lu uh, Nami's been doing something to like, somehow destroy the pillars, set an explosive, what have you, and she's the one responsible for one of uh, Usopp's things, who starts actually the collapsing angle of it. And it's like her prison, she's literally bringing down after all these years. But it's just like one of those things where it's like, I wanted her to have like one more, one more oomph forward here to kind of have that full catharsis with this. But still at the end, I was feeling great. I think if I was going to meet you in the middle on that, it's for me, the whole breaking down the building, I just, it, I remember it being a rather large sizable building. Oh gosh, so I too. think the concern would be Nami getting trapped as she's yeah. trying to get out. If I was going to change anything about that scene, I think it would be lighting all those maps on fire that she mm. had drawn. She has a fully complete map book that she's been working on, so obviously this like wall of maps that she made for Arlong has a very painful part in her, of, like, her history. Being able to burn that and then leave and then have it come down because of Luffy, that to me probably would have been the ultimate, you know, I just, sort of thing. Uh, my mind was fixating on how could she get out of there safely with like what we're talking about. And like, Luffy did his inflate thing. What if he just comes out of the rubble and it's just Luffy inflated around her? But then I was like, that's weird. <laughs> just skin folds in the just face. weird, like, like, is that your belly button or your nipple? <laughs> I don't know, Luffy, get off. I think they did a really great job for someone like me to get me invested. This leaves a beautiful transition for me asking, how would you rate One Piece Season 1 on a scale of 1 to 10? Overall, I felt like that was like an 8.59 out of 10. Nice. I really had so much fun with it. I can't wait to watch Season 2. I just feel like I can finally be a part of the conversation in some way. It seems like a lot of the One Piece fandom has really embraced it. I feel like it's just going to grow and grow and have more people become aware of it, which I think is the best option. Let's go ahead and end this on a dramatic high five. Okay, ready? Bah! Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon to support what we do here. And thank you to today's sponsor, Endel. <laughs> have a good one, y'all. <laughs> Bye.